So, a very, very good evening uh, to all of our uh, attendees uh, out here, to our esteemed audience. Uh, I can see uh, at the time being say, roughly about uh, the 200 people with us, but um, I'm sure most of them are on their way. The numbers are rising up uh, pretty, pretty fast. So, uh, firstly, let me welcome you all uh, to this uh, third in series uh, seminar uh, by SS Bilkem. And uh, I would say uh, to all of you who are attending, thank you for making this such a successful, uh, successful series. Uh, the last couple of uh, last couple of webinars that we held had uh, almost about uh, uh, close to 500 people attending each time. So that is that is almost at the full capacity of uh, full capacity of our of our webinar room. Um, so with uh, starting with a few a uh, few things first. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to thank. Uh, uh, why for uh, that is the Waterproofers Association of India for uh, you know kickstarting this uh, kickstarting this uh, entire thought process of holding a seminar series. Uh, especially from why I'd like to thank Mr. Sandeep Chaudhary, Mr. Kunjan Popat, as well as Dikshit Bajaj for uh, taking this uh, taking this forward. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, our partners, uh, TPH Bau Systema from Germany. So. Uh, uh, a lot of their inputs have been instrumental to us uh, in trying to put uh, put together this uh, two to three webinars. Uh, this particular webinar as well, uh, dealing more with waterproofing as well as soil stabilization, uh, also uh, also has got uh, the full inputs. It's actually kind of a, a, a I would say a collection of work that uh, that TPH has done uh, has done over the years. And also to uh, also to you know make this session uh, more interesting, more interactive. Uh, we have uh, we have with us uh, today joining the seminar now as well as for the more importantly for the question and answer session. Uh, we would have um, uh, Mr. Gyot Stintelnot. He's the owner and CEO of uh, of TPH Bow Systema, and uh, we also have uh, we also have Mr. Paolo Singos. Who takes care of the both the uh, sales as well as the uh, technical service across um, across um, uh, the world? Uh, let me just see. I see Mr. Paolo over here, so I'll just unmute you. Unmute you for a bit. Uh, hello, Paolo. Good evening. Good uh, evening uh, or good afternoon, Sunny. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Great. Thanks. Uh, I think it will be a great help uh, to have here. Uh, I'm also looking for uh, Mr. Gertz, but I don't think I can uh, I can see him in my uh, see him in my list as yet. But maybe he will. I'm uh, pretty sure he's uh, he would be joining us also for the uh, question and answer session at the end of the this one. So I would love to have you there, have your inputs because okay. a lot of the projects that we'll be sharing now uh, actually you have worked on and you have seen. So. Hopefully, we can bring our viewers a lot of the good uh, experience that you uh, that you had. So, uh, thank you, Paolo. I'll just put you back on back on mute. Mute. Okay. Thank you, Paolo. So, uh, so with that, um, uh, that's the more or less the uh, announcements going through. So, I think we can get uh, the session the session going underway. And what I'll do is I'll just. Uh, I'll just share over my screen over here. So, uh, what we're going to uh, what you're going to do here today is a is a little bit uh, different uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the presentation. So, uh, the format that we have chosen to do today, like rather like a running presentation with uh, slides and everything, uh, what we would be looking at is actually a pretty much like a continuous running video. So what we have uh, what we have planned uh, with this is that uh, we'll start off with giving or talking about some of the basic principles of injections, like what are the materials, uh, how do we actually select which material to use in uh, under which condition, and uh, you know some of the principles that have gone behind it, some of the research uh, that has gone behind it as to uh, as to the efficiency of these materials, the recyclability, and so on. And uh, then what we'll be covering is uh, more than about 30 minutes of case studies, you know, covering different application of these injection systems, uh, injection systems across uh, applications like waterproofing, soil stabilization, as well as tunneling. Uh, so I think with that uh, we can uh, get uh, get the session uh, get the session underway. So that's the video starting up. So once again, uh, welcome. Uh, 
We are glad to be holding this on uh, behalf of Assess Bill Kim Private Limited. On behalf of our partners, TPH uh, Bausystema, Germany. Most of the technologies that we, are, uh, we would be seeing in, the, in today's uh, presentation actually comes from the extensive work done by them, as also by IITD, uh, that's Institute for International Talent Development, uh, one of our training, uh, training and development organizations. So before we start off, a few, a uh, few very quick announcements uh, to make the uh, kind of experience better for you as well as for the other viewers. Uh, if I can recommend all the viewers right now to uh, to put uh, their uh, to put their mics on on mute. Uh, if you see, it's, uh, the setting will be at the bottom bottom left corner of your screen. <coughs> so uh, there you'll be able to see both. You'll find a way to uh, put your uh, mic on mute, as well as you'll find a way to uh, turn off your video. And uh, you can also see one more of the setting. It will be something called as side-by-side -side view. So if you do that, you can see the shared screen in one side, and uh, you can see my uh, my particular uh, running video on the other. So these are just a few uh, few announcements as far as the settings go. Then uh, a few announcements as far as the whole uh, question and answer session uh, goes. Uh, what we can do is rather than uh, rather than keep an uh, chat uh, chat thing running through the um, through the event, and you know it creates a lot of distraction uh, overall. So what I would request you is that you can send our uh, you can send your questions to Mr. Kunjan Popat. Uh, his number is right now flashing on the screen. Uh, that's nine eight two zero zero four four one one eight. Uh, it is also uh, in the invitation that we had sent you, you know, the, the photo invitation that was there. So that, uh, that particular thing has this uh, number as well. So you can, uh, you can uh, just WhatsApp your questions to Mr. Kunjan and at the end of the session, give, uh, he would uh, send, it back to, send it back to me. Okay, so with, uh, with that, we can, get the, we can get the session underway. So why we are putting this session together uh, is because of uh, simply problems like this. Uh, many times you'll come across, okay, this is a lot more, uh, I would say, a very extreme case like in a tunnel whereby, you know, there was extreme water leakage. Or in some cases, we have got problems like this, where your ground is simply collapsing, highly fractured rock, highly fractured strata. And uh, there is no way to pretty much put this together. So here's where materials like uh, materials, different uh, injection materials come together. And hence, we are holding the topic today, which is waterproofing and soil stabilization using modern injection systems. So basically, problems like that we see oftentimes in our sites. We see it in buildings. We see it during uh, building excavation. We see it in uh, we see it in infrastructure projects like bridges. We see it in tunnels. So there are a lot of a uh, lot of places where uh, these kind of problems come up, and these kind of problems have to be also solved out pretty quickly. And hence, we have to uh, think about resorting to modern injection systems. If you try to do things the old-fashioned way, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort, and it's not that uh, efficient or not that effective in most cases. So just to get a few ideas through the, uh, through the seminar, it would really help. So what we are going to cover, uh, cover today would be uh, a little bit along the principles uh, of this. Uh, the, the term that you see, PSGI, that is basically uh, referred to as polymer stabilized geoinjection. So what that means is whatever is substrated, be it uh, concrete if you're looking at waterproofing or be it different types of soil strata if you're looking at soil stabilization. Uh, so we are basically using uh, uh, we are basically using different matrices. So it can either be a uh, it can either be a cementitious matrix which we normally do as part of cement uh, cement routing or cement injections, or we can use today advanced materials like polyurethanes. We can use uh, methacrylate gels. We can use uh, epoxy systems. We can use uh, silicate, uh, silicate-based resins. Uh, that that is something we'll also see a, a lot in the uh, uh, in, in the tunneling or the soil stabilization aspect. So a lot of these new materials available, which when we use along with uh, which when we use to hold together, to bind, seal, to consolidate uh, concrete or soils, then that entire uh, system is referred to as a polymer stabilized uh, geoinjection. So uh, pretty much what we would be looking at is a little bit like what would be the purpose of doing this geoinjection that we'll cover in the principles. Uh, a lot of research has been done over time to see how, uh, how these different systems work. So uh, things like what are the basic prerequisite, uh, 
uh, then uh, how do we you know the part that goes in the selection of these materials uh, application technology and so on so we'll cover a little bit of that uh, the references are the practical case studies that i uh, that i was talking about earlier so what we would be doing is seeing a, a lot of videos kind of back to back to back uh, and we can see a lot of the different scenarios where these kind of uh, where these kind of materials have actually played an important part and help to solve the problem relatively quickly and relatively uh, cheaper as compared to you know uh, old fashioned construction technologies and finally we will uh, conclude the session a little bit with uh, uh, you know just bringing together everything that we discussed in the first three dimensions so starting with the principles uh, principles of uh, modern injection systems so if we think about uh, if we think about ground stabilization in the first part like uh, there are these three uh, these three techniques that were pretty much uh, pretty much looked at earlier on uh, the first one uh, was an, is actually a technique used more across uh, europe it's not not very uh, at least i don't remember seeing much of much of it in india uh, it's a technique that works on the principle of freezing the ground so pretty much you uh, just inject uh, nitrogen uh, really uh, cold nitrogen gas through the ground and since it's a gas it uh, kind of penetrates pretty well but uh, as you can see in the as you can see in the two photos here it requires extensive uh, extensive uh, machinery it requires very different application techniques and um, you know it's it's the uh, it's, it's effective because the ground freezes it holds the whole thing together so you can finish a construction around it and after that you just uh, stop the gas flow uh, soil temperature goes back to normal, but in that time your construction is already finished and uh, your uh, soil can rest up against your retaining wall. Over. So, but it uh, it is a bit of a cumbersome technique. It requires heavy machinery. It requires logistics, uh, high quantities of nitrogen. It's a little bit a uh, little bit tricky to a uh, little bit tricky to work with. Uh, some of the other um, historic type of um, uh, injections used, the most common one I would say even in India, what we use is cement injection. So pretty much we have got either uh, cement based materials or uh, microfine cements. So these are pretty much low in price. Uh, they have a long reaction time, but the top side is that uh, they also have a high compressive strength. Like if you are actually using it with a good, uh, the good uh, admixture and everything, so you can you can get strengths pretty much up to about uh, 50, 60, 70 newtons out of these kind of materials. Uh, but again, uh, these materials need uh, need heavy machinery to apply. So you need to have those big uh, mixing trucks. You need to have big pumping trucks. Uh, then, of course, uh, the other part with the lances and everything. So it does get a bit cumbersome to uh, to do it on site. Although traditionally in India, a lot of sites do use uh, do use the same uh, same kind of uh, uh, same kind of technology. But one of the key factors that you have to take, or uh, the key factors you have to take away from this method. Is that the hardening time or the time that is taken for it to reach, uh, you know, its full strength is uh, is 28 days. So that means uh, it it will be 28 days, you know, till the material has reached its full potential for carrying the uh, for carrying the load or for stabilizing the soil. So that is one of the things that's a little bit slow in its application. Uh, then one, the last thing that is uh, used uh, a lot of uh, uh, some of the metro projects I've seen they use it um, using sodium silicate as a as a um, uh, consolidation measure. So the advantages are that it's uh, low in price. It's got a long reaction time. It's it's very low viscosity, just like water. So it penetrates very very well into your soil. Uh, but the downside of it is that you require it in very very high quantities. So to use it more like a fill material or something, a large quantity is required. And um, the uh, another um, another downside of it is that it is brittle. So that means sodium silicate once you put it uh, put it in the ground, it kind of creates uh, kind of creates like a gel or like a solid mass kind of thing. Uh, and this mass is okay so long as water is water is there. So when the water goes away, the mass dries up and almost crumbles into things like powder. So it can be it can lead to an instability or brittleness in the future when you know when the ground is under. A certain amount of load, uh, and the third part is that it is uh, very very high in pH. So, uh, which is why also there are a lot of newer technologies that are replacing replacing your basic uh, sodium silicate. Since it's highly alkaline, it might be detrimental to uh, groundwater and uh, you know things in the ground. So it's 
just just some of the pluses and minuses of the different uh, different uh, technologies that have been uh, that have been used so this is just all three of them together at a glance so either ground freezing cement injection sodium silicate so there was always i would say there was always a need felt to look at something that is better so that is where this concept of psgi came thing uh, came through that is the polymer polymer stabilizing uh, geological injection so what this kind of material does is it it recognizes different uh, uh, different materials that are suitable for the stabilization of the soils you know some things that can be injected uh, down into the soil it can bind it well hold it well and work as part of the soil stabilization strategy and uh, so this kind of uh, methods are often uh, often done uh, using packers or injection piles directly into the areas to be strengthened and then uh, it is pretty much distinguished by uh, their high rigidity by their high stability and their high effectiveness i would say so um, some of the materials that are most commonly used to achieve uh, achieve these kind of things in uh, under modern uh, under modern methods uh, would be things like metacrylate gels uh, so these are these are again new generation materials uh, which are you know kind of both flexible uh, they are a bit elastic but at the same time have very very low viscosity can penetrate very very tough uh, soil strata including some clays uh, so it has a low viscosity and the ability to go uh, to penetrate very deeply uh, it can uh, the reaction time for it can be uh, can be controlled very easily so you simply do a mixing test so you know exactly how much part of a and how much part of b can when they react what kind of reaction time you're looking at so that's why this kind of material is coming into uh, is coming into uh, coming into the scenario because it's it's a new way of of uh, looking at things especially in the line of both waterproofing as well as in soil stabilization uh, polyurethane resins we have been using for a very very long time uh, so we have both uh, foaming polyurethanes which can be used as as fill materials uh, you have today uh, structural or very rigid kind of polyurethanes which are also very high in strength almost uh, i think uh, easily more than about 70 newton per mm square so we can reach those kind of strengths with the polyurethane resin as well and the other ones are much more you know for tactile filling which are uh, which means that it can penetrate well through your uh, strata but at the same time has enough flexibility to you know uh, take care of some movements uh, epoxy resins we are very well uh, aware of they have they have been used but uh, again to pump so much they are very very rigid very brittle systems so unless you really need that kind of a uh, uh, strength thing we don't we don't mostly look at it for uh, um i would say in ground stabilization application finds much more in say repairs and rehabilitation where you use it with concrete you know to inject uh, to inject cracks in concrete now silicate resins is again it's another a new a new kind of uh, material that has uh, uh, come to the fore so it is based on the basic uh, silica backbone that is silica uh, or silica that kind of uh, silicon dioxide backbone so it reacts and you know can we can make different things out of it it has got a highly foaming kind of material uh, maybe a tough consolidating kind of material uh, something slightly flexible that you can use under you know to bond ballast or things like that so a lot of applications come up uh, using using silicate resins and especially they are uh, they are very good uh, very good to kind of you know uh, put it into areas where the foams uh, the foams can form up to 70 to 80 times their initial volume so if you have large large cavities in your ground for example and you can just uh, pump in say maybe if you have a cavity like maybe 70 or 80 liters you can just pump in about uh, one or two liters of this resin into that place and it it almost swells up you'll also see this in one of the case studies and of course the last but not least is the mm -hmm. uh, cement based materials for uh, for injections so what is the basic purpose if you think about it uh, if you think about it in a few ways uh, the first one that we look at is basically sealing so that is what we refer to uh, what we refer to primarily uh, in the case uh, as in waterproofing then the second part is in terms of consolidation that means you use it to hold and to bind the uh, soil together and the third one is filling that means in case of uh, in case of like say maybe it can be something as little as cracks or voids in a concrete structure to large uh, large cavernous areas in a in a ground geology so for example when driving a tunnel or when uh, excavating for a building you have large um, just large uh, cavernous areas and you need to fill it with something 
So in that case, uh, that case, these materials can really be used to the full advantage. Now, if you take uh, uh, what this particular graphic tries to show you, uh, show you is that uh, how each material can be used uh, for what purpose. For example, acrylics are very good for sealing as well as uh, consolidation. Your PUs are good for sealing, consolidation as well as filling. Uh, your epoxies are very good in consolidation, which is why they are used in repair for you know for injection of uh, uh, injection of cracks and repair strategies. Then your silicate foam, uh, silicate based materials again, they're very good. Uh, they can bind very very well. They're uh, low viscosity, so they can easily penetrate through, consolidate a lot of the strata, as well as the foaming ones can fill up a lot of areas. So the application is pretty much across the board. And your injection cements too can be used under uh, under these different uh, circumstances. So, what uh, the basic thought process that comes like? Why do we have so many of these materials? Like, if we if you're talking about the injection cement or the injection cement plus your additives, then your silicate presence, polyurethanes, epoxies. So, in one way, if we take a look at it, their effectiveness or uh, where they can be used or up to what kind of fineness that they can uh, bind and consolidate. Uh, is pretty much dependent on their viscosity. So that is that is how we make uh, that is how we make the selection uh, between these different materials. For example, if you take uh, if you take um, uh, basic injection cement with additives, then it can bind it can travel through bind and consolidate something up to say something like a uh, something like a coarse gravel over here. Then if you're talking about ultra fine cement, then it can say bind and hold uh, and consolidate something like a medium sand up to here. Then your silicate resins, they have they have still lower viscosity, so they can uh, they can be used up to you know something like fine sands. So on, in those kind of uh, geological strata, you can use that particular thing. Your polyurethanes again have a still lower viscosity, so they can be used up to silt. And then your acrylic resins, they're extremely extremely low in viscosity. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our basic um, basic rubber tight vario tight systems have got viscosities as low as I think uh, uh, two to three uh, two to three MPAs, which means it's almost almost like water. Water is uh, water is one. So this one is just hardly two to three, and it's very close. So it can almost reach places. It can reach almost all the places that water can reach. So hence it can even used to be uh, used uh, um, in strategies, you know, trying where you're trying to kind of consolidate or hold uh, clay together. And of course, the last one it just shows you water, so what uh, is, is the least viscous of it all, and it can pretty much uh, go through all the different uh, all the different kind of you know, uh, sand strata. So this is the, basically the permeability is the basis on which we actually select. Uh, it is it is one of the guidelines in selecting the right material for the right application. Now another area which we have to really look at is also, especially when you're looking at um, both, I would say, crack injection as well as in, uh, in uh, soil stabilization techniques. Uh, the flow of water. So, for example, if your if your uh, conditions in which you're injecting they're dry, then uh, you can pretty much use any one of the uh, four or five different uh, four or five different resins that we took a look at. So you can use injection cements. You can use uh, the metacrylate, uh, you can use the metacrylate gels, you can use the polyurethane, the silicates, as well as epoxies. Uh, the same goes for uh, the same goes for moist conditions as well. Even even our epoxies today, you know, uh, to a certain degree, they can uh, tolerate moisture very well. So now the problem comes both in looking at structures as well as in uh, in soil when you have things like standing water. So even in case of standing water, the uh, the effect of actually uh, cement starts going down because it has got more water to contend with. So that changes the water cement ratio and hence the efficiency of the uh, efficiency of the materials. Uh, but in such cases, the effectiveness of uh, metacrylate gels kind of keeps on keeps on increasing over here. So also polyurethanes are very interesting to use in this because they foam up in contact with water. So if it's a good uh, good thing, it can go inside. It can consolidate even in case of uh, water or in case of uh, like flowing water, it can do it very well. Uh, silicates are very very apt to use in almost all these conditions like uh, uh, stand <coughs> standing water or lightly flowing or even uh, heavy heavy water flows. Uh, then your injection your epoxy systems are not. Uh, I mean you can use them up to uh, up to epoxies, but from this point on, it it's not it's not very very uh, uh, it's not very very effective to use. 
So when you when you have the problem with standing water or uh, slightly flowing or in a heavily flowing water, I think the best systems you can use are PUs and uh, PUs and silicates. And uh, metacrylates can go up to I would say lightly flowing water, but from this point on, uh, its effectiveness starts going down because it kind of mixes with the water and uh, mixes with the water and tries to go away. So that is some of the things. This is you know just a basic idea like under what conditions, what kind of uh, what kind of resin you can use. So to do this, uh, to do this, um, uh, to kind of get this idea on how uh, how to use this. A lot of research was undertaken over time. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, PSG, it means use of these modern injection systems in uh, in soils and concrete. So a lot of research had to be basically done to understand uh, the applicability of these materials to start off with, their effectiveness, like how good were they, could they actually stop the water, how was their consolidation performance, uh, how was their reliability in doing it. Of course, the durability aspect of it, like whether uh, the material disintegrates over time or the material disintegrates in uh, contact with you know, chemical, uh, uh, different kind of chemical loads. Uh, the, another one of the things was this environmental impact. So could this material, once you put it in the ground, uh, like in a soil stabilization uh, aspect to say, uh, could this kind of material be recycled easily? Because see, most of these materials uh, kind of qualify as plastics. Like especially if you are taking a look at uh, taking a look at the acrylic uh, acrylic based systems or with the uh, uh, polyurethane systems, they classify as plastics. But can you recycle them? Yes, the studies were made. Uh, st uh, studies were made to uh, check the recyclability of these things. Uh, when you put them back out of the ground, you could kind of separate them pretty easily from the you know uh, separate it easily from the soil and then use it as a sub base say, for road construction or sub base for something else. Or you know, just as a simple film material, silicate forms uh, they're pretty much kind of silica in nature, uh, something like a basic silica sand. So you can use it, put it or uh, recycle it across a variety of different applications. Uh, cement, of course, doesn't have the same thing, but anyways, you can use it for recycled, uh, like a recycled aggregate in, in parts of it and stuff. As well. so the recyclability aspect of it is also something that uh, that we took care of. And uh, so, and in addition to that, a lot of research was done to prove the durability of these materials. Uh, how do we recycle them? What was the environmental impact? Uh, then the next uh, next one was research to create the numerical calculation basis. So those were those two graphs that you saw earlier on. You know, the graphs that said, okay, under this kind of uh, with this kind of permeability, you can use this kind of material. So those were the research, and I mean, those are the basis. Or calculating uh, how much material can go under a certain condition and uh, uh, what material can go first of all and how much material can go. So all all that kind of things had to be you know worked out over the time and a lot of work went into actually uh, uh, into bringing up those numbers. And the last part was of course developments in the application technology. So once you're using modern materials, you need to have modern uh, modern application systems to also deal with them. So since since a lot of these systems are resin, they're based on uh, maybe just very few of them are one component, but more of them they're kind of two component systems. So then you uh, it needed development of special pumps to do it. It uh, development of special uh, handling, uh, special handling devices like this. Maybe then uh, it went into data recording and automation. You know, something like something that could calculate like how many liters of uh, uh, how many liters of injection is needed. And then control. So once 300 liters are pumped, it stops the pump and it flushes it out. Uh, flushes it out. Then there was, of course, the, uh, the injection and the mixing technology over here, you know, and how it is to be how it is to be pumped from the uh, from the basic receptacle to the uh, to the soil. So that also led to development of different kind of accessories. So things like injection anchors, injection spiles, steep pipes, hydraulic packers. So they are just basically different kind of um, Packer systems or different kind of delivery systems. So this is what this uh, these kind of systems are what uh, uh, is what are particularly used to kind of get the material from the uh, from the application side from the um, uh, from the bucket to the pump and to the soil. You know, deep inside, so maybe if you're looking at a tunnel or somewhere below the ground, then this is how you reach uh, those places. Of course, if you are looking at concrete, then uh, your packers are normally much smaller, much more easier to handle. Uh, they're mostly your drill packers or your uh, surface adhesion packers or maybe some hammer packers. So those kind of things you uh, bore packers. I mean, those are very typical, typically used for concrete systems. 
and these kind of ones are mostly used for uh, solid stabilization in uh, in those particular uh, uh, in those particular kind of applications. You know, once you have these kind of things, and once you know how to use uh, or to combine the the material aspect of it, that is the material selection, the uh, the machinery part of it, the delivery mechanism to the soil around it, and as well as uh, later on uh, people who can do with it like that. Would kind of you know uh, lead to controlling, uh, lead to controlling or lead to successful uh, completion of your job. So no matter what is the complexity, no matter what are the surrounding conditions, uh, there is I would say always a solution available to you know um, take care of many many different kind of uh, many many different kind of uh, application conditions. So these are just some uh, ideas like where where uh, the materials are to be used. Like I said, again, uh, some of the fields that we're using it is the mixing technology, the injection pumps, packers, injection pipes, documentation and automation. So you have to kind of bring all these different, um, I would say, expertises together. And which is why even also, uh, when also taking a look at uh, using this kind of technology, the materials are more sophisticated, the machinery to apply it is more sophisticated, the delivery mechanisms are much more sophisticated. So it also calls for, uh, I would say, a little bit sophistication in terms of the application or the people who are actually doing the work. So part of it, uh, part of the service would come from, uh, would say, come from our side or come from the side of, uh, um, from us, the material side, whereby you know we can even do things like having a small, um, like this is what is done mostly in European countries, that in case of emergency they can simply put a container on site. So, so that all the materials and the basic tools and everything are available at a glance. So that is just one of the, you know, one of the thought processes, one of the ideas that can be used in, in uh, problem solving. And also, uh, once you are doing this kind of work, it is not not simply like what is the material you have and what is the solution that you can take a look at. There are many many factors to consider in this. For example, even things like pH value of soil, or subsoil and ambient temperatures, for example, pot life of your material. Uh, the conditions, the spatial conditions, the conditions under which you have to apply. Sometimes your tunnels are very small and then to get the machinery and manpower in there and drill across to get there, there might be constraints of time and space. Uh, there, might, there will be constraints of environmental regulations. So, you know, so you have to at many times balance a lot of these factors and that is where I would say um, uh, experience also comes into, uh, comes into place. So that is why we also believe in, in applicators. So these are some of uh, some of our applicators who have been also trained internationally at the TPH headquarters. So these are guys who have already worked a lot in the field. Uh, most of them have experience of more than about um, 18, 20 years doing doing that sort of uh, that sort of work. And um, uh, so they are with us to also execute jobs of different complexities. So uh, this is again one of the key aspects of uh, you know applying things properly. So from there, once you take care of all these things now we'll go a little bit into the practical application so this is where the case studies start off so for the case studies what uh, what i managed to do is <coughs> put it into um, put it into three uh, three distinct categories uh, first we'll take a look at uh, the waterproofing segment like how a lot of these materials can be used across different uh, waterproofing strategies uh, then we'll take a look at how these materials can be used under a host of uh, soil stabilization strategies. And last but not least, there are maybe three or four ideas on how these materials can be used for uh, injection uh, injection technologies or injection strategies. So, if we... Oops, okay. So, one of the first applications that this kind of materials bring into place is stopping of strong water inflows. Uh, for example, this was a, a project in uh, this was a project in uh, Colombia, I think. And uh, during the excavation, uh, you know, the geology caused very, very water to come in at very, very high pressures. So, pressures up to six bar were encountered uh, were encountered uh, at the site. But then it became a challenge to you know drill your uh, drill your holes, attach the packers to that particular area. So you saw pretty much the um, the strength with which the water kind of came back through the borehole. And uh, they tried a couple of uh, solutions before. And uh, uh, what was happening was it was not uh, they were not kind of getting uh, not kind of getting the results that they were looking for using one component. 
so it was uh, whatever they are trying to put in through the uh, put in through the batters uh, was actually coming out and uh, it was not leading to the kind of results that they were looking at they were looking to both stop the water as well as solidify and consolidate the ground behind the behind the tunnel face so uh, efforts using the one component few resin systems were not not uh, kind of performing and another challenge that they were having was the low water temperature so because of the low temperature the reaction of the pu itself got in, uh, got uh, inhibited so that means the pu was reacting much slower than what it is supposed to normally react uh, so that was another problem so rather than go for a one component system what was suggested was a two component uh, two component system uh, with a bit uh, with uh, maybe say slight foaming but uh, highly consolidative uh, properties and with that the particular uh, particular injection uh, system was put in through those uh, through the packer system and you can see that as the injection as the injection process continues you can just see the the volume of water the one that you saw gushing earlier on it is kind of slowing down to to be much slowing down to a trickle and to eventually completely stop so even these kind of things, of course, this is an extreme condition in a tunnel. But even if these kind of problems are seen anywhere uh, due to high groundwater in, uh, in basements or even metro tunnels or uh, dams or any any kind of applications like that. So uh, the basic point is that we do have both the expertise, the materials, and the manpower to kind of you know give this kind of a solution. Uh, another, uh, this is another one of the case study where there was heavy water ingress in an uh, in an escape tunnel. Uh, so there was basically water coming in uh, through your uh, through your sheet piles and then through the wall, uh, through the concrete wall a bit uh, before it. That was also because of a little bit of the honeycombing and nothing. You can you can anyway see how how distressed uh, how distressed the uh, concrete around that part was and what was kind of you know. So this is how once the drills were made, this is how much water is kind of coming into your into your escape tunnel at a fast pace. So pretty much what was decided was to make kind of a small, uh, small uh, grid kind of uh, grid to put the uh, to put the resin in at different uh, different types. The so pure soft FS that was the material that was uh, that was used. It foams up slightly in contact with water. There was an additional plate put in, you know, to kind of slow a little bit, slow down the uh, physical barrier to slow down the water, fast water inflow, and then once. The injection started going through. It was bonding and stabilizing the whole area of the injection behind. So basically, whatever the kind of honeycomb concrete also that was there and that was you know uh, one of the sources of the of the leaks. So with the right injection system, when it was done, it was done in the grid, and you could pretty much uh, uh, go right to the edge, and it pretty much stopped the water rushing into the uh, through the injector. So this kind of this kind of applications are very very easy to handle. You know, large uh, like I said again, this is, this is more in kind of uh, tunnel application. But the same kind of problems also come in dams. Same kind of problems also come in uh, say small uh, small type metro tunnels. So that, that is where uh, these kind of solutions can really get. Like what we are basically trying to show you is just some ideas, like how different materials and application methodologies can you know help to solve the issues. Uh, this is another one of the uh, one of the case studies. So this was an uh, underground car park. Uh, this is in a city called uh, Mayen in Germany. So it was basically uh, basically um, uh, affected by a very high high water table. Okay. So once once uh, the water table kind of uh, kind of rose up high, uh, it started uh, the water started seeping into the joints as well as to the major parts of the wall itself. So now this is this is a, uh, actually a type of problem that is uh, seen most often in a lot of cases across even places like uh, places like Mumbai, for example, where where we have very very deep basements, we have very high water tables. So this kind of a uh, problem occurs quite a few times because it is at times difficult to uh, you know difficult to kind of anticipate uh, like what uh, if, if there was a problem, say maybe in the, maybe it's a construction problem, maybe something changed with the loading. Uh, maybe with the soil outside, uh, so there might be a lot of lot of issues to uh, issues to places like that. But those kind of things can easily be solved uh, by uh, by this kind of uh, injection system. So what this basically thought of doing was we did a curtain grouting behind the uh, behind the basement wall. 
and what was needed was that the material had to be uh, flexible and it had to be environmentally friendly so that it doesn't affect the groundwater anymore. So you can pretty much see that uh, once water was what was coming in through the uh, what was coming in through the cracks or or through you know through the voids in the in the uh, in the wall and you could see dampness all around the walls. So what was pretty much done is that there was a hole drilled right through and through the wall, pretty much to the backfill side. And from there, your uh, acrylic uh, methacrylate gels were injected into the uh, into the into this area, so that they formed kind of a curtain right at the junction of the wall and the soil. And this curtain, by default, uh, behaves like a waterproof waterproof uh, membrane. So it is basically what we also call in uh, typical parlance, it's negative side waterproofing. That means, or basically, it is positive waterproofing from the negative side. That means you're approaching a structure from the negative side, and then you create a you create an external membrane, which will kind of prevent uh, the water from water from coming to uh, to the other side. Okay, so normally curtain injection is done in a grid pattern. So that means you have it at the uh, that means you make the drill holes at intervals horizontally as well as vertically and then when you start injecting you can see up here so you create you create kind of a complete membrane system on the outside of a building so this is one of the applications that you can think of like even cases that are difficult to solve based on waterproofing problems that are difficult to solve then it can easily be done so another another aspect that came from the last case study as well as this one is that um, or another aspect of the materials itself is that these materials are uh, suitable for contact with groundwater or they are safe for use in contact with groundwater like even the even the acrylic system could uh, it's, it's environmentally friendly so once it's reacted it doesn't affect uh, groundwater or uh, this one in any ways we have the uh, certifications for it so you know at any point in time we should always ensure that you know, it should not uh, not affect the environment in any particular way. The same goes for uh, same goes for our PU system, uh, Purocrat as well. So this kind of uh, uh, epoxy system can be used again uh, with uh, both with uh, drinking water as well as you know in in uh, like in chemically loaded structures, like maybe say if you're looking at biogas plants or something like that. So it can be used under both uh, both kind of conditions. So this basically goes to waterproofing by a crack repair. So basically, there are cracks that allow water to water to come out. So you pretty much will crisscross across the crack, and you start injecting. So this kind of case study actually comes from uh, it comes from a practical uh, practical case that was done in Iran, I suppose. So you can see some some pictures of the uh, pictures of the site coming <laughs> right uh, right after this one. So the injection methodology. It remains. It remains pretty much same. We discussed it uh, earlier during our waterproofing webinar as well as during the repair webinar. So you just uh, you have your crack face, and then you just build crisscross and intersect the crack, and then you uh, go with the injections. Bottom to top. Okay. So it does. It does have. It does have its certification with regards to usage under those kind of conditions. So this was this was the project that I was talking about. So this kind of a methodology was the one that was executed here. So it's like a project uh, or a holding holding tank in uh, in Iran that shows uh, that shows leakages like this. So you know these kind of problems can very easily be solved. Like rather than kind of struggling with it uh, long term and uh, trying you know different kind of uh, trying cement grouts or trying. Uh, uh, cut and patch, you know, you cut it and you patch with a mortar and then pour things on top. And you know, most of the times, uh, these methods don't actually solve the problem. So something as easy as a crack injection system, like right? I think this entire uh, entire uh, problem was maybe done in the course of one day, and your structure is ready to go the next day. So there's hardly any downtime. So you can see that it needs it needs minimal machinery, minimal materials. You just plan it out, minimal manpower. You just do the injection, stop the water immediately, uh, solve the problem, and you know get on to the get on to the uh, next part of construction. That is one of the advantages of using of using resin injection system like this. So yes, the material in itself might be a little bit a uh, little bit more expensive, but over, uh, overall it helps save a lot of cost in time and uh, you know 
time and future thinking. So you don't have to kind of go into rework of the rework or re-repair of the system. Another area is uh, injection repair or say uh, waterproofing of uh, even things like masonry. So you can do this both with uh, you can do this with polyurethane based materials. If you want to treat more of the uh, cracks, you can do it with a flexible the methacrylate uh, methacrylate gels. Uh, but the application procedure more or less remains the same. So you go along you go along the base. So you inject the uh, means you intersect the uh, both the concrete as well as the joint. And you can go through both the joints as well as through the uh, through the body of the uh, body of the masonry wall, and you simply go in with an injection system. So it kind of helps both stabilize. It helps consolidate. For example, if uh, if a brick wall is seeing a lot of water through the years, it might have been uh, might have been uh, damaged. So I would say this is this is something like this you can use for newer walls. Of course, for heritage structures, we might need to think of. Of uh, different kind of ideas, a different kind of application, to just ensure that it is you know not not affecting the uh, uh, the dynamics of the structure as a whole. But pretty much the grade injection system, you can see. Once you do this, you can pretty, uh, you can pretty much stabilize and consolidate the entire wall, and then prevent water from coming in uh, from the other side. But this kind of treatment has been found effective, and in a lot of the tests, it, it can even uh, mm -hmm. resist water up to almost five bar pressure. That is almost 50 meters of water head should not be an issue if you are if you are uh, treating the if you are treating the wall kind of in this particular way. So these are just some you know different ideas like we saw we saw concrete uh, we saw water tanks we saw deep basements uh, like this particular case study would go into a little bit uh, it's a it's a little bit an offshoot from a metro. Uh, so one of the one of the issue that comes up is sometimes when uh, when the uh, segments are being Put in place, uh, then the compression seals between the different uh, between the different segments uh, they might be damaged. Uh, maybe maybe during the uh, installation process or you know something did not go right when the gaskets were being uh, were being put together. Uh, anything might happen, but uh, oftentimes this kind of a defect does come in uh, does come in uh, pretty much uh, many times through the tunnel the person in the tunnel and. Uh, this is where most of the water would kind of enter the tunnel through the joints. You can imagine a tunnel is pretty much a very highly jointed system. It can water can come in from a lot of different points. So uh, one of the easiest ideas to uh, to remedy this kind of things is using a needle packer. That means you pretty much use a packer and kind of drill right through the right through the defective seal. Okay, it doesn't doesn't create uh, doesn't create a uh, you use a needle packer. You go right through the seal, pretty much down to the other side. Let's take a look. You puncture the defective seal, and then you inject a, a then we inject the metacrylate, the very flexible metacrylate gel, so that it forms a curtain on the uh, on the outside of the uh, of the tunnel. Line. So here you can see uh, that they put in the they put in the needle packer, they put in a packer to help inject the material. You can see the water coming in. And once this part is injected, it just creates a, you can just see. So it fills up both the, the whatever is, whatever is uh, uh, damaged, the damage to the, uh, to the gasket itself, it seals that, as well as the area behind the, as well as the area behind the joint. So at any, any point in time, if there is further uh, water in that is trying to come in, then that, that doesn't happen. And it is, it is pretty quick because the gel reacts in almost about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the gel is again uh, compatible to brown water, it's not a problem, and it's waterproof to almost 12 bars. So, a lot of things, even under those kind of really uh, extensive or extreme conditions, this kind of thing works. Uh, even if you're looking at, say, expansion joints in, uh, in buildings, especially in areas like basements or underground or in tanks or in any one of the structures that is, that is resting on the ground. Uh, then oftentimes the expansion joint um, along with the water bar, like this is the place where often time uh, it fails and the water the water kind of comes in into the structure so here again a similar kind of methodology is used that means uh, what we are doing is we are drilling in through the water bar you know just uh, go right through and through the water bar you go to the other side of the water bar okay then you attach your attach your injection packers here you go all along the line of the joint okay so you attach your injection packers and you can again use uh, 
uh, use a material like variotite. Uh, so variotite is again a metacrylate uh, gel. So inject it. The material is highly flexible, so it easily it will take up any any movements so that your expansion joint may uh, expansion joint may come under. So all those movements are easily easily solvable by using using say a material like variotite. So you know these are very easy. Rather than uh, oftentimes what we see is that uh, there's a lot of struggle in trying to solve problems like uh, problems like this. Multiple times this will be opened up, then uh, try to treat it, with, uh, try to put some kind of mortar in it and uh, sealant, and you know, it becomes very uh, uh, it becomes a little bit complicated. So this can be an easy way to look at uh, look at remedying uh, uh, defective expansion joints. So next, uh, the next area that we take a look at is um, is uh, soil stabilization. So this might happen. Like this is actually a case from uh, this is actually a case from one of the tunneling projects, whereby some uh, fault zones are encountered while drilling. So you can actually see that you can actually see that uh, the rock was highly fractured. So what was pretty much done in that place, uh, it had to be solidified at some point in time so that you know the tunnel uh, TBM can go through. So what was done was pretty much uh, uh, the silicate foam was injected into this silicate foam material. So this has got an expansion factor of somewhere about uh, 70 to 80 times its initial volume. That means one liter would make almost 70 to 80 liters of foam. Okay, so you can see just that that material was uh, the material was kind of injected into it, it expanded, and it kind of folds and consolidates the entire rock uh, entire rock face together. And the the best part of that kind of a material is that uh, this is just another another case study with uh, with uh, sheet piles. It kind of follows the same technology, so I'll just let the video run. Uh, but the best part about using this kind of a material is that one it uh, once it pours and consolidates, so your the final strength of your consolidated or held together mass also increases quite a bit. So you can get strength say almost up to 20, 30, 40 MPa. So it's, it's pretty strong. To uh, pretty strong to kind of uh, bear a lot of load, but at the same time, for example, if in, in case of tunneling, the uh, the TBM finds it's much easier to uh, drill through this kind of a uh, to uh, to drill through this kind of a geology. That means it is having both a highly stabilizing effect, but also when you're trying to further drill into the system, it makes it easier and uh, lets you know lets the TBM pretty much grip that area and uh, the drive becomes uh, pretty much smoother. So now, in case of if you are looking at deep excavation by doing uh, by doing sheet piles, so this is just the uh, construction sequence for the first set of uh, first set of sheet piles. So you pretty much do that. Then you go uh, go in between them and uh, do do the next uh, next set of sheet piles too. So oftentimes, before say if you are doing this for a, a building, for example, or even if you are cutting across a roadway. Or if you're looking at damaged uh, roadways due to due to erosion or something like that, you know, whereby you have fractured fractured uh, areas of rock like this, so this is basically kind of solution to uh, solution to take care of those kind of those kind of problems. So you can pretty much you first create your uh, you create your sheet pile wall. Okay, you're retaining all that will hold that will hold the uh, soil behind it. So once this is done. And we can simply go, uh, you can excavate a maybe a very small part, you know, make it make it uh, make it accessible, and then what you need to do is stabilize this fractured area behind behind the wall so that the sheet pile doesn't kind of slip down. So we are pretty much using drilling methods to go right or uh, right into the into the fractured area. Use the right kind of uh, say the injection spiles or even the long uh, long tube into go that the injection lances. And then see, uh, say a material like solid seal, for example. Again, it's got a very low viscosity, maybe hardly 240, 240 MPAS. It's it's very low viscosity. Uh, it has got a very very high compressive strength, reaching almost 80 newton per mm square. And you know, it again one of the uh, main things is that uh, it cures very fast, so hardly 20 minute curing time. You pretty much do this, use this in kind of a nailing, uh, like a nailing operation all along the sheet pile wall. So you anchor, you anchor your anchor your sheet pile wall very well, and then you can proceed with the rest of your excavation. You know, down to down to very low level. And from here, maybe you can start your building construction. Like this example will show uh, will show a track and a uh, track and a uh, tunnel running through it. But 
this kind of uh, this kind of a problem is uh, encountered many many times in our buildings or even when you are doing going for deep structures even station buildings for example so that might that can be one of the uh, one of the solution that we look at uh, another area that we do is uh, anchor solidification that is what we refer to commonly as soil nailing so in in cases say there is flowing water or in case there is uh, or in case you know, it needs to be done at a very fast pace then your anchor nails uh, like if you do it in the traditional way that means you drill it then you uh, put in your reinforcement you try to uh, put in a non string grout you know the grout needs to be uh, needs about 28 days to get strength and so on so it, it kind of slows down uh, slows down the whole process and in case you're dealing with very unstable geology often times you don't have time to do something like this so in this kind of uh, in this kind of a situation what uh, what you can do is again use uh, use a silicate um, you can use a silicate based material to uh, to use as a um, as a grouting system uh, for installation of the anchor grouts so it can be used with running water there is no problem uh, no problem in contact with water uh, even if the reaction temperatures are low uh, it reacts pretty fast and i think it achieves most of its strength in hardly about uh, i think within uh, half an hour to i think one hour of of injection it uh, gets almost most of the most of its uh, strength so basically what you can do is you can uh, you can kind of quicken the pace of your of your uh, stabilization uh, problem part of it so this is one of the areas that uh, is actually from a practical project where they where they did this and your soil nailing you can use this you can also use this for you know uh, once you have those gpn walls or something like that you can use it there a lot of applications for it uh, another area of uh, this uh, another area of application is if you are looking at say areas under under constant traffic like under train tracks in the stations mm -hmm. uh, station buildings if you are looking at uh, metro station buildings for example so this is kind of an example like that whereby uh, there's a train line uh, train line running at the top and the station wanted to add like another shaft you know for a for a lift uh to uh, to access the lower platforms so in this kind of a thing it was a two fold or two fold thing one is that uh, one is that the soil around uh, the soil below the tracks had to be stabilized you know so that it doesn't come into the excavation area and at the second point in time the shaft itself since it was made with a precast uh, precast technology had to be kind of waterproof Around the external. So the problem here was that the ground was not stable. Uh, there's a lot of vibration caused by train. Uh, very very minimal space to then actually put in the uh, put in the uh, uh, to put in the uh, uh, precast unit. And also the time itself was a factor. So the solution here was looking at down injection with stabilization. so again what was used was a uh, was a very typical uh, methacrylate uh, methacrylate gel system okay so you can just see the the see the video coming up so what was simply done was this was the already access area that was below the below the station so we simply went with uh, went with lances the injection lances through the through the wall and into the uh, into the surrounding soil area Okay, so access was that way. It was limited over here, but you could still put it in. Uh, start the injection process. You can see the you can see the injection machinery on your right. Once you start the injection process, you slowly start consolidating the ground, the ground around you. This is the other part of the three D view that you can you can pretty much look at. So after that, one can easily one they could easily just uh, excavate this part of it. install the install the precast uh, the precast structure the lift pit for the you know for this one and there were two again there were two uh, pretty much i would say um, let me stop it for a minute here okay so there were two uh, basically advantages of doing that one was that uh, the precast segment got waterproof by default as well as then it was protected you know against the uh, one was the protecting the uh, Excavation from coming in, and also it was strengthening the area below the tracks. So even in case of track stabilization, this kind of a system can very easily. Uh, another area uh, which is very interesting to use this is kind of stabilization of you know small dikes and dams. Like oftentimes you see most of our dams do not be very very big structures, but uh, even if you look at Maharashtra, there are 
uh, I would say lots and lots of these uh, small dikes and dams that kind of hold the water and then supply them at a later point in time. So over time, what happens is that uh, with the rise in water, with the rise in water levels, there is a tendency for water to go through the dike, and that may then slowly over time cause erosion. So what we need in this kind of a case is to stop the water in the first place, and then also stabilize the uh, stabilize the entire dike system. So what is pretty much used here would be to stop the water, maybe something like foam seal. It's a two component, very uh, fast foaming uh, silicate foam. So you pretty much uh, inject a small area of it. It kind of expands and fills all the uh, fills up all the uh, all the voids within that the water that the water channel had created. And then on top of that, uh, you can then stabilize it with something like a uh, something like a metacrylate based system like rubber type. So this kind of a system, you do it again in a grid across the entire dike, and then this entire area will be subject to you can after that very easily take the loads. Uh, there is no further uh, there is no further uh, ingress of water, and you, and here in the picture here you can see how how effective it is at consolidating those kind of pulse data. You know, uh, this was tested like in practice for over ten years. Uh, you can see the ductility of that kind of a ductility of that kind of a material. So it can very easily be done. The last segment that we'll be looking at is a few examples or a few case studies from the uh, tunneling side. So, for example, this was uh, this was one of the um, uh, one of the projects that was taken was uh, the underground underground line in Berlin. So here, as the as the TBM was progressing and the uh, uh, and the work was going on, at a certain at a certain uh, point. So they, they detected there was a problem with the uh, there was a problem with the uh, you know with the tail seed of this. So it could no longer be uh, it, so the the machine could no longer progress. So the TBM could no longer progress, and you know there had to be a break taken, and this tail seed had to be changed to you know keep the keep the uh, progress going. So a little bit some of the challenges that you can see on the other side. Uh, the soil conditions, uh, you know, limited space, and they have to do a quick turnaround because the TPM can't be standing in one place for a long time. But the TPM could not move forward until the tail seal has been fixed. So in this case, the sealing and consolidation was done with a was done with a silicate resin. So again, there was a grid, as you can see, there was a grid created along the along the tunnel face from the inside to the outside. The silicate foam was injected. It could. Uh, it would pretty much uh, consolidate, seal and consolidate the entire area around around the uh, around the uh, around the segments, so that you know when when you move that when you move the TPM a little bit further, the uh, the overburdened soil won't collapse into the won't collapse into the tunnel. You can see, so once we started the sealing and consolidation with the silicate presence, it, it sets very very fast. So uh, hardly within a few uh, few hours, you know, uh, or say maybe within an hour or two, the entire thing had gained strength and um, the soil around it was stabilized. A few of the advantages of this one was there was no problem of flammability. It was semi-elastic in nature. There is no again no problem with the water. So once this area was consolidated, they could easily move the TPM a little bit, replace the replace the tail seal. Okay. And then the process of then the process of tunneling could uh, very easily continue. So now, if you think about it in terms of cost, like maybe it was a certain manpower and maybe three days. In three days, they could do this entire entire problem. Now, if this TBM had kind of continued and if there was a cave in, then that would be of course a much more much more expensive disaster. So it is this kind of situation that can be uh, solved in tunneling. Of course, it's a very simplistic way of putting it forward. But this is just some ideas for our uh, for our uh, viewers from the tunneling segment to think about. Now, in case uh, during during the TPM run, if uh, say like fractured rock or uh, you know very brittle kind of uh, geological formations are encountered, so in that case uh, you can also you can also do a twofold kind of uh, we can also do a twofold kind of uh, uh, solution for it. For example, you can first Break apart the rock. You can do a backfill, you know, backfill around the uh, around the collapse uh, collapse on the surface. 
Then you first do the stabilization with a metacolate gel based system. So pretty much simple lances, uh, simple injection lances. Stabilize it with a, with a material like rubber type, you know, very, very low in viscosity, hardly 2.5, 2.6 MPAs, means almost like water. Uh, so again, you can uh, choose the reaction time, we can make it react in 10 to 40 minutes. No problem with ground water. And then what we do is with the fractured rock, you kind of consolidate this fractured rock with a uh, highly foaming silicate, uh, fast foaming silicate foam. So what it does, again, uh, with a low viscosity, it can pretty much reach uh, reach different areas of the rock. You know, it can consolidate it, and uh, and, we, and the tunneling can proceed for further very easily. So again, one of the last case studies. Uh, if somebody is looking at micro tunneling, and again, there are there are um, say the seals between the between the segments. If they have kind of failed, or if there is a leak through any one of them, you can see this is a kind of micro tunnel. So along the joints, the joint seal has uh, joint seal has maybe broken. And this kind of a this kind of a problem can be very easily remedied with a uh, polyurethane system, for example. So simply drill in, drill in through the uh, through the seal. Okay, you start your injection process, and it kind of solidifies and holds together like pure stock flex. This is one of the again uh, very ductile filling, ductile kind of a polyurethane. Very low in viscosity, uh, reacts in hardly 50, uh, 15 seconds, and the reaction is complete within 90, uh, 90 seconds. It can be used very easily in flowing water as well. Good, good uh, extension. So overall, it can you know seal these kind of applications very, very quickly. So all all this was um, all this was meant to show is that there are a lot of applications for these kind of uh, or these kind of materials. Uh, I mean, you can even take a look at it uh, more like a, I would say something around like a profitable use of modern chemical power. It, uh, it's not not just the initial uh, not just the initial cost part of it, um, but also what it can do is it can help uh, solve problems very very quickly. So here you have to often consider the time cost, uh, the time cost of the money, and you know uh, things like uh, oftentimes during driving or uh, during excavation. Uh, there are often situations that are, uh, I would say, in certain cases, avoidable. For example, if you know there is flowing water, you can stabilize it before. If you know there is fractures, you can stabilize it before. But sometimes it happens that you don't know that something like that is going to happen. And in that case, even as a reactionary measure, uh, using using a modern injection system can really help the project, you know, uh, carry on forward at a much much faster rate. So the downtime is very very small because these materials gain uh, gain their complete uh, strength in in a very very short period of time. Uh, tunneling operations become more effective. So driving excavation or those kind of things are very very effective. And it needs, I would say, uh, compared to a lot of the other kind of uh, methods, it needs very less construction equipment. And what it offers in terms of durability, since in most of this like acrylic gels. Uh, I think in one of the projects that uh, that we saw uh, in the dam projects, like it, it has stood for over 19 years. So these materials are very very durable. The polyurethanes, of course, they are kind of plastic, so again, uh, <coughs> a very very uh, long life for these kind of materials. And you know, it can be a very effective effective solution, pretty much for uh, most kind of uh, waterproofing or uh, soil stabilization based that. So with that, uh, I would say thank you very, very much uh, for listening. So that, that pretty much brings me to the end of uh, end of my presentation as a whole. And uh, we'll now open up uh, open up the floor to uh, floor to questions. So what we'll do is uh, I'll just stop the stop the share over here. Okay, can everybody see me? Okay. Uh, what I'm what I'm going to do uh, very quickly is I'm going to put uh, Mr. Paolo on unmute. Paolo, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you? Great. And uh, do we have uh, Mr. Gyotz as well here? Uh, I haven't seen him. Uh, let Let me just take a Let me just take a quick uh, quick look. No, I don't think uh, I don't think we have him. Uh, he probably didn't made it today. 
so what what i'm going to do is i'll just quickly uh, scroll uh, scroll through my uh, my questions up here okay um so okay i'm starting to get uh, starting to get this questions uh, questions over here so first one is um this is from this is from uh, mr amit uh, chippi from hiranandani uh, for clay soil uh, to avoid collapse which method is suitable uh, for grouting in india yes. for clay uh, soil yeah clay from clay yes and <laughs> that's a tricky question huh? yes uh, well uh, clay is uh, probably the most difficult material to be jack you want to answer or should i answer <laughs> no please go ahead your 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 uh, your your is our official uh, possible yeah <laughs> no please please go ahead and answer no, okay the clay is very difficult if not impossible to inject for a physical question so uh, there is no way uh, of stabilizing clay directly but right. there is a possibility of doing it indirectly so it's a combination of Uh, injection with anchors and uh, uh, using polyurethanes. I would say non-foaming polyurethanes, but uh, uh, fast-reacting two-component polyurethanes, uh, named Purostop FS or FSF, yeah. and then creating an intricate uh, combination of plates of polyurethane, getting yeah. cutting into the clay soil and stabilizing it. It's uh, quite tricky. It's possible, but it's not immediate. correct so so basically uh, if i can just um, um amit ji if you are listening uh, if i can just sum that uh, sum that up uh, so pretty much you have like multiple multiple points of injection and you create uh, you create pockets of resin surrounding like a uh, like a volume of soil for example you just uh, create like say two three four uh, lances let me see if i can get that uh, if i can get that uh, you know there's a white board kind of thing mm. no i can't i can't actually i can't see that option <laughs> i can't see that option up here anyways uh, so basically what you do is you just kind of go uh, you cannot consolidate it directly that means uh uh if if the clay doesn't allow water through it so there is very little chance that it will even allow something like a acrylic uh, acrylate uh, gel to kind of go through it so that would be one of the one of the um, uh, uh, issues in doing that so what you create is a network of of injection spiles and through that you inject the resin so and then this uh, the resin will kind of interconnect as a network and then it will hold the uh, it will hold different clay particles uh, different kind of you know uh, areas of clay together that might be one of the one of the easiest way to easiest way to do it uh, then there was one question by uh, one question by mr rajesh prabhu so uh, he says my question is uh, while using a two component system uh, if the water is gushing whether we have uh, whether we have to use first foam for injection to stop water then resin uh, if it is yes what will be the timing between the two injections for me also hello uh, yes um, you can use, use either or actually we have stopped very strong water inflows with foams so foams are resins too just a foaming resin um it is not a permanent solution if you use a foam so you are correct if we, you get stuck with the foam and then you have to reject something else to make it permanent correct um the time is uh, i would say immediately after we have done jobs uh, when we stop the water in the morning and the right after the 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 break we we went and injected the definitive material okay. so maybe something as as quickly as a couple of hours probably yeah uh, so what was, what was the system uh, in the first the, the project from colombia then what was the system that was used there that was uh, a puro stop fsf as you uh, correctly right. pointed out of- and they also added some uh, thixotropic uh, catalyst to make the material thicker okay so that is that is like a rigid uh, that is basically like a structural pu kind of format yeah it's a structural pu uh, reacts very fast 
uh, as you have seen, there was this epsilon connection, so both components were conveyed into the mixer and into the, the, the ground, okay. and uh, they they stopped the water there. They are still working in this project, actually. Okay. If I may digress a little bit, this project in Colombia is a very long uh, uh, or a very big long uh, dam with these uh, tunnels with leakages. They have the lake and they have a limited budget, so every year they do one part of the project. So yeah. it's going on like four years now, okay. and we are still supplying, and um, they are working very successfully. Great. The only thing is that they have limitations of budget, so they have to make every year one piece. So step by step, yes. It works. Yeah. So um, there is uh, another question. Mm. Yeah, uh, is there any side effect of these chemicals on engineering properties of soil, like shear strengths or altering drainage properties, as they are important sometimes for bearing power of soil? Which of these injection solutions are suitable for improving expansive soils? Okay, uh, side effects, uh, yes, there are positive side effects, I would say. Uh, what I say usually is uh, we may not know what the effect will be, but it will improve the soil. So you will not have, you will never get a worse result than before. You always improving the condition. Right. Uh, right. There are researches going on to develop a, develop a calculation method. So it's a mathematical model being uh, done by the uh, some universities here in Germany to right. to like we do with cement. Uh, using resins in soils, you can forecast or uh, calculate uh, uh, before using uh, what would be the effect, the uh, structural effect on soil. So we are working on that together with some uh, academical uh, uh, professors to to get to this to this model. Yeah. We have the first uh, um, results already uh, coming out of the of the research. Correct. And if I if I'm uh, also uh, I would recommend yeah. that in case we have got. Uh, in case we have got time before the uh, before the project, then we can also or uh, we can always uh, look at doing a small kind of mock up somewhere. So we have a good idea, like do a do a test, like how fast your resin reacts. I mean, those those are the basic things to be done with the QC of the material at the site. But also just do like a small mock up, maybe something like in a barrel or something in a bigger container, and actually see how far it uh, goes under a particular condition. So those kind of those kind of uh, things can very easily you know help uh, mm -hmm. sort out this issue. Uh, then there is a very okay. multi-part question. Mm. There is a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, it says. In the escape tunnel, uh, the leakage was shown through a termination wall. Was the tunnel a hydro tunnel? Hmm. The the tunnel in Colombia is uh, is no, the next one. Next, the one where we showed the escape tunnel and uh, water coming from behind the sheet pile wall. Uh, yeah, that's a hydro tunnel. Yes, it's a hydro project uh, going on in in Chile. It's called Alto Maipo. It's a uh, sixty-seven long uh, kilometers long uh, hydropower project. Okay, let me just go through, see if there are any more any more questions coming up. Mm. Okay, there are a couple more coming through. Where is it? Just one minute here. Okay, this was uh, this was another question with regards to the silicate foam. You know the uh, the foaming, mm -hmm. the high, uh, the highly foaming uh, materials. Mm -hmm. So one is, does the increase in volume due to the foam uh, create any lateral pressure on the wall? Uh, yes, yes, it would. So I, I, I we would, have I, done also here research. Uh, we have it, it tested on the laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, as a rule of thumb, you can say every time uh, that the resin increases is reflected in one bar uh, pressure on the on the wall. So we have like a fully confined resin, mm -hmm. and uh, the expansion of uh, twenty times was uh, equivalent to twenty bar of pressure okay. if the resin is completely uh, contained. 
Uh, of course, if you are injecting in a void, you are injecting some resin, and yeah. then it, it's free to expand, so there is no uh, pressure immediately. Eventually, when the resin fills the void and then starts to press against the walls, and there will be some, some pressure. But oh. you can, so let's say, also indirectly control in the case that you don't put all the resin at the time. You, you inject, let it foam, and then inject and let it foam until you have the cavity completely full. Yeah, because I would say primarily we are looking at uh, primarily we are looking at um, uh, kind of filling up a void. So exactly. we also normally have an idea of what is the void volume, and then maybe you just go a little bit more to kind of ens ensure complete. To have some uh, some uh, self compression because then the resin self compacts and gets more uh, stronger yes. than the, the original foam. Okay. Uh, there is another uh, another uh, one question. <coughs> Uh, is polyurethane grouting of leaking podium slabs a foolproof solution uh, in sense that leakage point may stop and leakage may start at another place? This is from one of our, uh, um, uh, from uh, Mr. Pithawala, one of the uh, more experienced people in this field in Mumbai, mm -hmm. uh, with Hiran and Nani construction. So uh, he says, is polyurethane grouting of leaking podium slabs a foolproof solution uh, in the sense that leakage point may stop and it may start at another place? So, Paolo, your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, indeed. Because let's interpret, uh, you have a joint and the joint starts to leak in the weakest point. So, the water pops up in the weakest uh, point. Okay. And if you go and make a point, in a point injection, it will stop the water at that place. And mm -hmm. then the water may appear somewhere where it never showed up before because it was uh, free to be released in the, in, in the weakest point. Now that's closed, it goes to the second weakest point, and then you have to go after it. A little bit. So, so it's a fire and error, but uh, I'll just. Recurrent, uh, recurrent problem, actually. Yeah, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, uh, try to get Mr. Pitawala online. Yeah. Yes, uh, can you see? Uh, did, that, did that answer your question? Uh, it has answered the question, but then uh, the only point which I want to make it, it is not foolproof. Uh, no, see, injection. It is all. It is. Uh, I would say, if I think of it as a as a, a philosophical thing, it is trying to already fix something that has been already damaged in the first place. So, yeah, but then what happens? The place where it was not leaking starts leaking. That's what I am trying to tell. No, normally that won't happen because um, uh, see, it will just find the next point. So basically, it points to uh, leaks, uh, leaks all around. Uh, the next uh, point which you are saying is was not leaking previously. Now after. This point has been closed, then the leakage has started. Okay, okay. okay. Now, we have a, I had a case similar to this, and uh, there was a tunnel, and they had cracks in the tunnel, and some uh, it was bare rock, no, no lining, just the cracks in the rock. Yeah. And uh, some cracks were leaking very heavily, and other cracks were dry. So, what I said to the uh, contractor, to the customer, say, you go and you seal the cracks which are dry with mortar. Go there and just mortar the cracks which are dry, okay. and then inject the cracks which are which are leaking with polyurethane. So he said, "Eh, hey, but it's uh, it's a cost. We have to go after all the cracks. So we would prefer to go to the solution. We inject only the leaking cracks, in the hope that the dry cracks will not leak. But but it, it happened that they uh, sealed the cracks with the polyurethane." And then the water appeared on those previous dry cracks, but far away cracks, because the tunnel was a few kilometers long. So the water reappeared where it never appeared before. So okay. uh, they had to make a second run of uh, injections. But then at that point, they still had uh, some dry cracks. They uh, okay. filled the cracks with mortar and injected the leaking cracks. There, so, can also be, there can also be a case where, you know, there are very, very micro cracks which cannot be seen by the eye. And yes, from yes. those cracks, the water could, could have come out. That's what I, I have concluded from what you have said just now. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a recurrent problem, actually. When we say, no, you have to make a preventive, uh, uh, a preventive uh, uh, solution to uh, avoid the water. No, you are trying to sell me more material. You want me to do more work. <laughs> I will go for the, when I see the water, I stop it. And we can guarantee that we can stop the water there once and for all. But if you don't make a, a, a let's say, a, a 360 degree treatment, the water may reappear on the other side. That, that's mm. right. That's the okay, okay. Got it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so then, one of the other questions that we've uh, we've got here is um, uh, from uh, this one is from Mr. Uh, Balamurugan uh, from LNT. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh, yeah, he's here. So I'll just unmute him a bit. Uh, so Mr. Balamurugan from LNT. So he's inquiring whether these uh, are these materials fireproof or fire retardant, etc. I think this is. Uh, relating more to the uh, i think the materials that are used for tunneling if i'm not uh, not wrong mm -hmm. uh, mr balmurgan uh, i think we can have you online so yeah yes i am online now uh, i am able to hear you yeah, so uh, the query is that uh, once we do this uh, sailing and, and all uh, will it be do the fireproofing in during their service life and second thing is that i would like to know the service life of uh, of this product mm -hmm. okay and the polyurethanes are not fireproof they burn so okay. forget it <laughs> if the okay. fire uh, fireproof is an issue um, polyurethane is not the product uh, then we have to use silicates because silicates are absolutely non-burning or uh, even the acrylics because they have water in their uh, contents we have also uh, burning tests or uh, flame retardants to, to be applied on the product the polyurethanes in general are not fireproof. They will burn. They will definitely burn. Uh, so if fire is a concern, I would say uh, use silicates and or acrylics. Means 10 or 20 years of service life. Um, in the, 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 normal, the normal life, yes. It's okay, if there is an, a fire in the tunnel, then uh, the material will be eventually damaged. But for the normal uh, application, uh, utilization conditions, the product will not burn. Do not start fire and will not and, and will last for the, the the twenty or hundred years depending on the on this uh, service life of the of the tunnel. Right, I think I think in one of those okay. damn examples that we saw, I think uh, there the acrylic uh, system I think that lasted for almost nineteen years, wasn't it? Nineteen twenty years, I think. If I'm we uh, have currently rubber tights uh, tested for twenty years. Uh, already tested. We have uh, uh, next year. I think now this year should be 24 years. We have uh, every four years the new update of the test. And so, for Variotype, we have uh, currently 16 years ongoing test of durability. So these these do last pretty long. End of the day. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So we can rest assured that it already served 24 years. Yes. yes. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. I just okay. wrote yesterday for, for Canada. It's a project. They asked uh, 100 years lifetime for variotypes. So we, we had submitted the, the actual tests we have, which are non accelerated aging tests, but actual aging tests of the product, which is a, an ongoing test. And uh, we, we can guarantee that for if there are no major changes in the environment or the conditions, the product will last for 100 years, which is a normal. Uh, let's say working life for a kind of project. Okay, and uh, so we have one last uh, one last question. Uh, this is by uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Manoj uh, Anaukar. So uh, the question here is: Actually, we have two uh, questions. One of which now I'm just losing the question since I'm reading through WhatsApp to get the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, compared to conventional methods of soil stabilization, uh, how costly uh, are these injection methods? Uh, I'll just get uh, uh, Dr. Manoj, are you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. You can hear me? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'll, Paolo, if I can ask you to. Mm -hmm. You are our uh, official, you are our official uh, question, uh, question and answers guide today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The cost is, uh, is at the end of time. If you if you compare the kilogram of resin with the kilogram of traditional cementitious materials, of course there is no gain. The cementitious traditional material is uh, less costly by far. Uh, the the difference is exactly on the uh, equipment because you have a much smaller and much mobile equipment. You have uh, a smaller team of people, so you have less manpower or labor involved. And you have a fastest, uh, um, let's say, reaction or response of the system. So you don't have long waiting times. 
Uh, in, in France, uh, where they use the, the material for the anchors of the soil nailing, uh, they also made the comparison by using uh, cementitious mortar, sixotopic mortar, or so whatever. So the cost at the end, the, the, the actual cost was 10 euros less per anchor. And they have 1 million anchors. So uh, you can imagine that. Uh, uh, and, and the reason was that they could inject with a smaller team faster and tension the anchors and make better production. So the, the productivity of the site was higher than using traditional cementitious grouting. And at oh. the end, uh, the final cost was uh, less than using the, the traditional. Um, in excavation, in the, in the excavation of tunnels, so the traditional methods, so drill and blast or just digging, um, you can have also 30% uh, less cost in managing uh, some emergency emergency situations. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, uh, just one last question that we have to take uh, is the question is um, which method and ma which method and material uh, will be effective to prevent the settlement of foundations uh, in silty clay type of soils? Would polyurethane be effective? Uh, yes, will be a combined uh, system of polyurethane and anchors. So you have to polyurethane and anchors. Well. Yes, yes, yes. So great. Uh, so I would say with that, I think we have come to come to an end uh, uh, end of the questions. Uh, let me see if there is any other. Yep, I think that that pretty much more or less covers it. So just going through the WhatsApp WhatsApp list of questions again. So uh, I would say thank you, thank you very very much uh, to all our attendees, to all our viewers. Uh, for attending today, for making this again uh, quite a successful. Uh, thank you, thank you, Peter Ola, sir. I can see you on the screen here. Uh, so thank you to all the viewers, everyone, for making this successful. I think even today at its peak, we had uh, almost about 400, 450 people yeah. attending. So pretty good. I hope we could add a lot more ideas, uh, a lot more ideas to uh, uh, to how you can do things, to how you can improve projects, how you can make it faster. Uh, in case you have questions, again, uh, I would say. Uh, please, uh, you can write to us. I'll just, uh, I'll just flash the, I'll just flash our um, um, email address once more. Just give me a second here. You can write to us at any given point in time. Uh, you can give us a call at uh, call at any given point in time. Okay, so let me just go back here. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so uh, this this that you uh, this that you see up here, uh, info at ssbuildcamp.com. So please uh, feel free to. Uh, feel free to write to us, uh, and we shall uh, we shall get back to you with the answers as soon as we can. So once again, thank you everyone. Thank you for uh, this one. Have a great evening, and uh, see you soon.